Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Sri Lanka Medical Association monthly clinical meeting in collaboration with the College of GPs of Sri Lanka. So this is on for this month and uh, I'm very happy to be chairing this because I'm part of the College of GPs and I'm very happy a young team is presenting something very interesting. Beyond the clinical walls, beyond the, your clinical walls, a family physician's journey in healthcare. I think it's a lovely topic. So without much ado, I will call the moderator, Dr. Dineshani Hittiarachi to take over and conduct. So as the chairperson of the CPD committee of the CGPSL, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to today's session on Beyond the Clinic Wall, a Family Physician's Journey in Healthcare jointly organized by the Sri Lanka Medical Association and the CPD subcommittee of the College of General Practitioners of Sri Lanka. The presenters for today are Dr. Mary Lo Dilani Dharmakhan. She's a family physician and a lecturer at the Department of Family Medicine, Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of Sri Jayapadmanapura, Sri Lanka. We have Dr. W. Bihan De Silva. He's a family physician, a visiting lecturer at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalania. He's also a GP trainer, a mentor, and an examiner. He's the CMO of MediHouse in Kadavata. We also have Dr. Shane Malita Halpe. He is a registrar in family medicine and MCGP trainee. Today, we hope to uncover inspiring stories and valuable insights, shedding light on the profound impact family physicians have on our healthcare system and our communities at large. We will explore the diverse and impactful roles of family physicians play not only within the confines of their clinics, but far beyond. Thank you for being here, and I look forward for an engaging session and a thought-provoking uh, session today. Thank you. Uh, to start off, may I kindly invite Dr. Mary Lou to the podium. Thank you, Dineshani. A very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, firstly, let me thank the Sri Lanka Medical Association and the uh, Ceylon College of General Practitioners um, for inviting me to share my insights on this forum. Uh, I will be walking you through two cases that I encountered in primary care. And um, I thought these were very interesting as well as they highlight some of our principles in family medicine. So the first case is about this 70-year-old gentleman who had bilateral low limb weakness following poliomyelitis. He used a walker. He presented to me with complaints of numbness and pain in both hands and loss of grip strength in the right hand. The paresthesia was more in the thumb, index, and middle fingers of the left hand, and he felt numbness in his whole right hand. The paresthesia and pain were more in both hands in the night and there was difficulty in picking up small objects with the thumb and index finger. There was no history of joint pain or stiffness or symptoms related to rheumatoid arthritis, no increased tiredness, constipation or symptoms related to hypothyroidism. The patient did not have diabetes and there was no history of weight gain or recent trauma. So he was a hypertension, uh, hypertensive for which he was on losartan 50 milligrams PD and he was not on any other drugs. He had a history of poliomyelitis for which he had been on crutches and now the walker for support for the last six months. He lives alone with a caretaker to help him. He's retired government servant who draws a pension. His brother was settled abroad but checks on him regularly. 
he was very concerned about his symptoms as it was causing an impairment to his mobility and independence. He did not take alcohol and did not smoke and his appetite was fair. So on examination, we saw there was a hyperpigmentation and callosities on the ulnar border of both palms of the wrist. There was no weakness of any of the muscles except unopposed adduction of the little finger. His reflexes were all normal. There was atrophy of the hypothena, thena, first web space and intarsious muscles of the right hand and also the thena muscles of the left hand. The sensation was reduced in all five digits and the palm of the right hand and the lateral three digits on the left hand. Uh, his phalanx test was positive for both the right and left hand. So this was the picture that we saw. There was a wasting. Um, there was a wasting of the first web space here and also atrophy of the hypothena and thena muscles on the right side and there was a wasting of the thena muscles on the left side. So what are the differentials that you would think of in this patient? So carpal tunnel syndrome is the commonest diagnosis in patients who present with numbness, pain and weakness of the hands. This patient also had the typical symptoms of uh, carpal tunnel syndrome at the wrist. If the median nerve is compressed at the forearm, there wouldn't be any numbness on the um, thena eminence. And the patient will may complain of more forearm pain. If there was a radiculopathy or a myelopathy, uh, sorry. If there was a radiculopathy or myelopathy, the patient would complain of more shoulder pain radiating to the arm. And also there would be loss of reflexes and there would be um, inability to extend the elbow, the forearm and the fingers. And uh, if there was a brachial plexus syndrome, that is more rare, but the sensory distribution would be the whole of the axillary nerve, as well as the reflexes will be lost. So what is the diagnosis that you would think of? So here we see the features of a median nerve compression in both hands, and also the atrophy of the hypothena muscles, the first web space muscles, along with the loss of sensation, uh, of the ulnar nerve distribution shows that there is an ulnar nerve involvement. There is no other motor involvement, so we can rule out a higher lesion. So most probably it's a compression neuropathy of both the medium nerve on the right and left side and also the right ulnar nerve at the wrist. What would be the cause in this patient? So we know that the walking frame can cause both median and ulnar nerve neuropathies secondary to the pressure around the wrist because there's a lot of pressure, um, this can occur. So we know that this patient started using the walker around six months ago. So that's what I thought was the cause for this patient. So this compression neuropathies, we need to pick it up early so that we avoid a compound disability because he's already disabled, uh, disabled in his legs. If the hand muscles have already undergone atrophy, even after decompression, motor recovery is not complete. So what do you do to confirm a diagnosis in this case? So you need to do an ultrasound scan of the nerve. So you see the co um, compression where it is and of also a nerve conduction study, which will show you an ulna and median nerve involvement. So what are the treatment options available for this condition? So you can try rest, splints, injection of local steroids and also surgical release. So actually this patient was referred for surgical decompression, but he declined because he was aware that there was a period where there is non-weight bearing. So this would limit his mobility and his ability to live alone. So to allow him to take support from his forearms, they prescribed a gutter frame. This did not solve the problem and he came to me with a worse hand function. So the downside of surgical intervention is that they have a period where they can't bear weight on their hands, where they won't be mobile. So these sort of patients may not be able to manage at home alone if they lose mobility. But at the same time, if this continues, their hand functions will decline. So it's a vicious cycle. I was able to 
explain to the patient about this and also arrange a proper supportive home environment after talking to the family so that he was able to undergo the surgery and have the proper support with home visits and the necessary care. So the take-home messages here is that combined ulna and median nerve palsy around the wrist can occur when patients with lower limb impairment take considerable pressure through hands during walking with a frame. So we have a lot of these patients coming to us. So this is a common presentation. Early diagnosis followed by surgical decompression should be considered because you prevent the loss of deterioration of the hand function further. And following surgery, they will require some time where they can't use their hands and they should be supported adequately. So moving on to our second case, it's a boy who is two years old, was bought by his mother with a three-month history of recurrent wheezing. This was more when he was active. There were no symptoms of cough, fever, difficulty in breathing or choking, and there was no personal history of asthma or eczema. The mother was able to recall that the first episode of wheezing started at a birthday party. There was no previous episodes of wheezing or recurrent respiratory tract infection. There was no history of seasonal symptoms, no history of nasal symptoms, and the child did not have features of atopy. There was no family history of bronchial asthma in both parents. There were no history of allergies to drug or foods. The father is a non-smoker and they have no pets. So I had been seeing this child since he was about three months old and I was a bit perplexed as what was going on. So on examination, the child was active and not tachypneic. His vital signs were normal. There was no strider or audible wheeze. When I auscultated the lungs, there was an intermittent wheeze on the right side, but the breath sounds were equal. Other examination findings were not significant. So what are the causes of recurrent wheezing in a preschool child? We see that it's estimated to occur in about one third of preschool children. And the most common cause is recurrent viral induced wheeze. Bronchiolitis and viral pneumonitis are more likely if the patient has chorizal symptoms. But this was not the case in this child. The next most common cause of wheezing is asthma, which affects about 15 to 20% of the pediatric population. But he didn't have any features of asthma as well. What is the most appropriate investigation at this stage? So this is what I did. Children with recurrent wheezing, I think should be investigated with an X-ray. So I did this because I wanted to check for any congenital anomalies of the lung or if there was any parenchymal lung disease, a possible foreign body and cardiac abnormalities. So I saw that there was a right lung hyperlucency with no mediastinal shift. What is the most likely diagnosis? So in a child with non-specific respiratory symptoms with unilateral lung hyperlucency on chest X-ray, a foreign body aspiration is the most likely diagnosis. But having said that, most foreign bodies are radiolucent and not visualized on the chest X-ray. And it's important to note that chest X-ray may be normal in approximately 50% of the foreign body aspiration cases. And you should not use this to exclude a diagnosis. How would you further manage this patient? Now, we have to remember that foreign body aspiration is a medical emergency. The next management step is to proceed with the appropriate hospital referral. So this child was referred to a tertiary care hospital for further management. HRCT was done, which showed a regular lesion at the distal right main bronchus, which caused an obstruction. The patient underwent bronchoscopy and a small plastic flower decoration was removed. The patient was discharged after completing one week of antibiotics. So why are children at a higher risk of aspiration than adults? So they are, they are more likely because they don't have molar teeth. Uh, their swallowing mechanism is immature. Their laryngeal reflexes are not properly developed. And in addition, they like to play when they're eating and explore things with their mouth. So how common is this presentation that I got? 
in approximately two thirds of the cases, patient present immediately to the ED, while the rem remainder usually present to the general practice. So that's why I thought that this was important for us. This is because approximately half of the foreign body aspiration occur without adult supervision. So the event of the choking event is not observed by anybody. So the take home message in this case would be that foreign body aspiration must be considered in children with non-resolving respiratory symptoms. We must do a chest X-ray if they have recurrent wheezing. And as primary care physicians, we should be aware of this presentation. So that is what I wanted to share today. Um, is there any questions? Yes, sir. So was this patient distressed with his body? No, no. There was a, there was a, uh, there were episodic wheezing, sir. That's all. When he was uh, doing something, like if he was running around, if he was playing, there was an episodic wheeze. So there was a problem where we thought it was a in exercise induced asthma, but it wasn't settling just because he was uh, resting as well. It was a very small one, which was not causing a proper obstruction. Runilateral. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Merlo. That was a very interesting case presentation. Now I invite Dr. Bihan de Silva uh, to continue with the case discussion. Thank you, Dineshani. Uh, I thank the SLMA and the College of GPs for inviting me for this uh, lecture. That's an uh, opportunity and a privilege to uh, talk to you today. Uh, second. Uh, actually, uh, I will discuss uh, one of my cases I encountered last year. This case actually uh, happened uh, on the New Year's Eve that this was my last patient I saw uh, for the year in my clinic. This is a uh, experience which uh, I practice uh, around in Kadotha, so in Kadotha area. Uh, let me uh, do some briefing uh, other than the uh, scientific part and all this. Uh, let me uh, discuss a bit about uh, family medicine, how we do and what we do uh, in general practice uh, clinics. So uh, family physicians are seeing ambulatory patients as we all know. So this uh, family medicine, uh, general practice, whatever you call it, is a discipline which requires science and art of practice equally. Since uh, general practice is a subject of breadth rather than depth, one cannot expect a general practitioner to be a master of any any area of medicine. So in uh, general practice, multiple factors contribute to the quality of the consultation. Example, physician's knowledge, skills, attitude, experience, and uh, especially uh, his or her soft skills. So all the uh, this consultation will depend and the outcome will depend on these physician factors also. So we will have to uh, always remember that because 
patients come in Sri Lankan context, we see patients uh, for about standard three to 10 minutes of consultation. So during that consultation, we need to at least uh, uh, get into a probable diagnosis as to what this complaint is about and do the justification for that on that day. So uh, it's a very uh, crucial thing and a tricky thing. Uh, so these are the factors that I wanted to discuss before discussing the case. So if you say take soft skills of a general practitioner, these are important in uh, maintaining the consultation and it, it actually has an impact on the uh, final outcome also. The practitioner needs to need for his uh, patient care would be the confidence and friendliness, empathic listening, respectfulness, analytical thinking, and prioritization and negotiation and so, some other qualities also. But these are main ones that you should have in order to carry on a, a general practice uh, consultation to maintain a very good uh, relationship with the patients. So at the, at the other end, there's the patient actually. So the patient factors uh, involved in the quality of or the efficiency of the consultation is the level of education and the attitude of the patients and social and financial condition and uh, the past experience. So combined with this combined factor only, the outcome will be decided at the end of the consultation. So the consultation in general practice is a bit tricky as I mentioned uh, before, because we see ambulatory patients. Thus, if we do not focus ourselves uh, at the problem at the hand at that moment correctly, there is only a minimal chance that we correct our mistakes we make there. So knowing that, uh, keeping that in mind, so we'll get to our case. My uh, patient was a 28-year-old girl, married, a garment factory worker, complained of abdominal pain for six hours duration. And she had a low abdominal pain, more on the right iliac fossa, and she had menstrual bleeding for five days. There were no clots passed, no back pain. There was no fever, no dysuria, no nausea or vomiting. Uh, bowel open, it was normal. And there's no significant past medical history. And there's no uh, significant family history also. And the past surgical history was not, not significant. As there were no obstetric history, she's been married for the last three years. There's no, there was no con conception. And the gynecological history was she's, she was having 28 day cycles and uh, three days of menstruation and no clots. And she has missed a period once uh, the month before. At present, she's menstruating and she claimed of she, she's having menstrual bleeding. And she, she was not on any contraception for the last three years. So she did not have any uh, allergies. And her social history was she was a garment worker, which is uh, also located to where, I, where I'm practicing uh, and married for the last three years, as I mentioned earlier. And the husband also works at the same garment and lives in a rented house, no extended family support. They are from a, uh, <clears throat> a distant area. Now they are, have come here for work purpose. And income was satisfactory. And there was no alcohol or smoke involved in either her uh, or husband. So at the end of the uh, history taking, uh, as usual, what we do is we try to come at a diagnosis. So uh, she was coming with low abdominal pain and, uh, and menstrual bleeding. And at the, as, as usual, I, will, I would want to go into a differential diagnosis of uh, acute appendicitis. So these are, these are things that were running in my mind. Is it the appendicitis? Is this PID? Is it a ectopic pregnancy or a twisted ovarian cyst? or maybe a simple UTI, which comes up with low abdominal pain. So uh, as, as we know, these general practice setups in this country, far and wide, uh, are with, uh, it is in a spectrum. 
there are uh, very sophisticated areas you can give uh, very sophisticated services also. And there are very bare minimum general practices also. What I want everyone to think is, I mean, wherever you, despite every, wherever you work, I mean, if you get into use to a consultation in this, in a proper way, I mean, you, you will do a very good consultation and a, make a come, real uh, outcome despite of facilities that you have. So uh, for this, after the history taking, so this is these are my uh, differential diagnosis. So that I wanted to examine this patient. Then on examination, I found that she was very much in pain. And while she was walking in, I un understood that she had an antalgic gait. And if she was febrile, the hydration was good and she was not pale. And the CRFT was more than two seconds. And uh, his her hematological status was she was had five pulse of 19 per minute and was regular. And the blood pressure was 99 and 68. And the respiratory rate was 18. And she had sh shallow breathing and vesicular breathing. And she had no added sounds. Abdomen moves with respiration, but it was the movements were reduced. And she had tender right eye like fossa and a supra pubic area. And there was no free fluid, gross free fluid, no organomegaly. The bowel sounds were normal. So at this end of uh, the examination also, uh, what can anyone suggest this occur? Got this history and examination. It's a young girl, 28-year-old girl, coming in a very odd hour. You have abnormal pain for six hours. And uh, right iliac fossa. And, and she's complaining of menstrual pain. But her expectations, that we always ask about the expectations of the patients, ideas and the concerns and expectations. She thinks that she's, the, she's menstruating and she wants pain relief only. She wants to go back home. Because since it's a, she had missed a period last month, and she's not she 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 did, she was not concentrating on that, and she says then I just missed a period and it has come down again, so I want uh, it will settle, and I want pain really only. So uh, at the end of end of uh, the examination also, I was thinking how to proceed from here. Because now the now in in a primary care setup in an odd hours, these are the things to for me to consider, right? Uh, this is an EVS doctor obviously, in very late night, and all the pharmacies and labs around were closed, so I can't get any any support from uh, the surroundings, and the GP had a long day and he was exhausted as a personal thing, and the patient was in pain and she need, needs relief. And I don't have investigation facilities because at that point I didn't have a urine it's strip also to do. So I was in, at the end of my wits actually what to do with this patient because now I knew that uh, there can be a sinister sign, sin, sinister condition in, within with her. So uh, unfortunately, at the end of the examination also, I was left with all five, all five uh, differential diagnoses. Again, I could have it could be appendicitis, it could be PID, it could be ectopic pregnancy, it could be a twisted ovarian cyst or an UTI. So, uh, so what uh, my uh, golden question uh, to be answered at that point was: treat to or refer? Should I treat this patient or refer? So, in order to make that decision, I think I used a simple technique as we have used it in uh, our wards when we are doing in the ward work and secondary care. I completed the abdominal examination with, with a vaginal examination, right? On vaginal examination, I saw that uh, the valve was uh, blood stained. Obviously that goes with the uh, menstruation also. So then when I uh, uh, did the VE, uh, there was cervical excitation and there was right side phone is tender 
And when I buy manual palpate, there was it was all tender on the right side. And the uh, pouch of Douglas was clear. So I I knew that it was uh, something to do with the uh, con conception. So this patient needs a gender referral. Uh, so I thought of thought that it was a right side ectopic pregnancy. Um, then what I did was uh, I couldn't take a chance because it was a very very odd odd day on an odd odd hour. So I wanted to give the benefit of the doubt to the patient. So I gave a uh, referral immediately to the second uh, uh, tertiary care center, which is very close to me, is uh, the North Colombo Teaching Hospital. It's about 10, 15 minutes away. Sorry, pardon my uh, handwriting. So uh, this is what I wrote. I mean, I, I wrote her um, complaint and uh, her vital signs and uh, the vaginal uh, uh, dominant findings and the vaginal and then I, I just said in that uh, uh, referral letter I just want uh, uh, yeah, uh, I'm suspecting ectopic pregnancy um, just to whatever is which, which is needed so at Colombo North Teaching Hospital uh, on the same day and they, but they have done uh, ultrasound abdomen and they have found that right side there was a right side ectopic pregnancy and uh, it was leaking and uh, there was free fluid inside so that 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 is the uh, scan findings and uh, this is this is the this is the intervention that has been there she has gone to the profit and um, they have they have done a right side uh, self gave to me uh, soon after uh, the first thing in the morning that is after the, his uh, uh, fasting was completed and uh, she was uh, settled by that surgery. So uh, in the follow-up, uh, as family physicians, we do not end our care in one point. So after the referral, I always uh, have a habit of uh, knowing, uh, exploring what's going on with my patients. So on day three, the patient was discharged from the hospital. And day five, actually, the patient came, uh, came with the hospital records and to my clinic. That's where I took all these photographs uh, as a courtesy call. So this is how a relationship between a doctor and a patient, um, doctor-patient relationship builds up. So she was happy and I was happy. I think I was more than happy. I was happier than her. So that uh, she, she survived to uh, fair, live, live the rest of uh, the life. Um, the patient had no complaints regarding the surgery and was recovering well. And uh, I knew that in the long run, uh, she will have another problem so because she's uh, one of her um, tubes are gone. So she will have to mine the fertility with the remaining tube. So we will discuss a bit about uh, the fertility issue, issue and uh, contraception if she wants, wanted. And that was how it ended with the follow-up. So uh, I, uh, though it, it was a very small encounter, uh, these things happen every day. So we, we need to make this uh, decision of treating or referring uh, within this given short period of time of consultation. So what I wanted to tell, uh, uh, share this, why I wanted to share this experience with you all was, the positive things that I have had in managing the patient and the negatives that I had. So the primary medicine principles, if we discuss what we, what I practice here in this case was, uh, it was the first contact care, that's a principle. And it was a comprehensive care. And she, she came for other reasons also. And uh, there was continuity of care. She, she came back again and uh, she, she came back again afterwards also. And there was a coordination of care, which had happened, uh, I suppose uh, it happened in a proper way uh, so that it was, the outcome was really good at the end of it. And there was a health promotion while, while she came up in the sex, uh, next visit. So, um, so these are the things that we, we practice every day. We practice, everybody practices with their all patients 
one or two things at least we do out of all these family medicine principles. So in this particular case, uh, what I want to ponder upon it was is uh, the reflection that I have I had because I was in a problem because due to these reasons. There were pluses, there were minuses from my side also. One thing was I did not have a simple urine HCG strip at that point, which I of course I do have, but it was it was maybe at that point it was not available. So it doesn't have to be because you can still do certain other things to explore what is going on. So it is always better to keep check on all what is necessary to manage patients, your crash trolley, your essential uh, investigations, examination tools, and all this in regular intervals. Otherwise, you'll never know you, without one of these you'll, when you will bump into a problem. So that was uh, that was something I was reflecting on to keep my uh, instrument and things that checked up regularly and equal attention to patients even physicians is very exhausted so during during the daytime in a clinic maybe we see about 100 200 patients clinics so we go in the evening we are part time practitioners so we deal deal sometimes deal about 30 to 40 patients so it is tiring it is tiring so it doesn't i mean i my message for you is because things can happen in any patient. So keeping attention to all patients equally is, is a very uh, required uh, uh, necessity from a general practitioner because he's a, he's a soul of person. He's a soul man. If you, if you miss something and you let loose the patient, uh, there's nobody going to follow up unlike in a ward setup. So, I mean, no matter however exhausted you are, keep attention to patients. So the other uh, important thing is I want to highlight here in this case was importance of complete examination of a patient could save lives. So in this Sri Lankan setup, I work, work with seniors, my colleagues, juniors and all. I see that most GPs due to various reasons tend to disregard the importance of a vaginal examination and a rectal examination whenever it's needed. Whenever it's needed also, they think it's an offense. So in this case, if I did not opt to do this vaginal examination, I would have treated her with the pain relief and sent home. And she would have collapsed at home. So I think uh, you have to have some sort of a uh, negotiation with the patient and uh, complete the complete examination uh, about the necessary things that you have to do during that consultation that is up to the GP to uh, discuss and negotiate. I mean, this saved her life. So that's why I'm uh, sharing this with you. And of course, uh, I want to share a bit of a personal thing uh, that I do in my clinic. I keep a register of all referred patients. Even before you go, she leaves my clinic. I have all the patients for the last six, seven years. All the patients I have referred to any other consultant or a, a, the hospital, which is the North Colombo Teaching Hospital. So I have their basic uh, details. So I will always call back on the following day and check how they are right so i think that that's a good i suggest uh, that's a good good thing to start all general practitioners so at the end of it what i want to tell you is this is this is very crucial for uh in general general practice this murphy's law this is a general thing actually this is not a medical thing so I mean, for general practitioner, I think it's a superb advice, a motto to follow. What it, Murphy says is, if anything can happen, it will happen. It doesn't matter where you are, who you are seeing, at what time of the day, which patient, it doesn't matter. In any patient, if something can happen, it will happen. So that was one, one 
one time that I ex encountered Murphy's Law because that was a very dire uh, situation that had come in a very odd time. And uh, if you keep this in your mind, I mean, your patients will be safe and you'll be safe and things will end up in a very positive tone. Thank you very much. Any questions? This is a single experience general practitioner's referral pattern from the Gampa district. Even if you have 40 cases, no problem. Because we are we are in a big fix at the moment. We do not know the mortality and morbidity patterns. Each of you have data, but we don't have it collectively. Last time we had it was in 1996. And that also only 40 GPs participated in that survey. So we need to, one thing good, we are improving as individuals. I'm very happy to say this, but we are collectively not improving. Our data is not being fed into places where decisions are made. So may I suggest you to write that even 10 cases, no problem. Write it and send it to a journal. Thank you very much, sir. I will definitely do that. Yes. Just to uh, uh, Bihan's uh, story, as a I'm talking as a 41 year experienced GP, uh, don't uh, ever take these patients tend to find excuses. Do I have to go to hospital and evade, you know, and get around, say, give a painkiller and say, don't ever get caught to that because you have your red flags in place. You have to insist. Some patients will say, no, we'll take some medicine and go. So it's a clear thing. So yes. I'm glad you referred this patient immediately because that's one of the top one red flags, ectopics. So you can never, you should never miss an ectopic. That's the main thing. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Dr. Bihar, for that very eye-opening case presentation. So from the suburban areas, now we will move to the rural areas and explore how a family physician's role differ in the rural communities. I invite Dr. Shane Halpe to share his experience. Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, my talk will be the one before lunch. So hope this will improve your appetite. So uh, my topic is where community meets medicine, the journey of a rural family physician. So you can see here a picture uh, of a, so there is a palmyra tree and there are, there's a herd of goats. So this picture I took from uh, in Jaffna uh, village. So uh, at the end of this presentation, what I want to emphasize is uh, it's not only in Jaffna, we find rural areas, even uh, rest of the region. So, so family medicine, so it's a focal point of primary care where uh, the GPs or the family physicians treat most ailments and provide comprehensive health care from womb to tomb. So, uh, so these pictures uh, I'm using to highlight uh, a pattern. I mean, two things here. Well, this one of the uh, Kovils are in a village, and another one is a very famous uh, Nallur Kovil. Uh, just to highlight that, uh, you know, there is a rural area as well as an urban area. Similarly, there is a rural healthcare as well as urban healthcare. So uh, there are specific challenges we come across working in rural areas. So one is limited infrastructure and lack of multidisciplinary approach. Also, there can be, there are sometimes inadequacies in government policies and also financial allocation and uh, lack of awareness uh, about primary care uh, is an issue in rural areas. And uh, collaborating family medicine with community medicine will uplift the prevailing primary care system, I believe, which also uh, something which Professor C. 
Sivanyana Sundaram believed, and uh, he was one of the pioneers uh, involved in the Alma Atta Declaration way back in 1978, uh, in which uh, the public should be an active participant, and the uh, and this system will provide healthcare according to the local needs. So this uh, model is called community oriented primary care. So community oriented primary care is a systematically developed strategy. It's a proven uh, strategy which integrates family medicine and community medicine, delivers primary care to individuals, families, and the community, which focuses on the principles of family medicine. So this is how it has evolved. So let's say a patient comes with a problem. So according to the principles of family medicine and community medicine, uh, we provide uh, patient-centered care. And also there is active patient public involvement and engagement, so which strengthens the primary care delivery system. So uh, just to um, show you some of the principles we work on, the, these, uh, there are nine principles uh, according to uh, the McVinney's uh, textbook of family medicine. And, uh, so, and also based on that, there are specific roles and functions of the family physician, which Dr. Bihan also mentioned. And uh, so I will um, go, go through. My talk will be based upon these things. So... Uh, Experience in the northern province uh, at, was at this place, Family Health Center, Condaville. So, point number one is this, an open-ended commitment to patients. As family physicians, we can't say, uh, when a patient comes with a certain problem, sorry, it's not my area, I can't manage. Uh, so, hence, uh, in the northern province, these are the issues that I saw, including multimorbidity. And there are some specific issues, uh, maybe more common in the northern province, like gender-based violence. And also there's issues like uh, drug addiction. Actually, it's there in every province, but I saw it was a bit of an issue there. So uh, as family physicians, uh, we can't handle everything. So we need to coordinate. So we need to integrate. So we there is uh, we should integrate vertically with the other prime other systems uh, in place, uh, the primary, secondary, and the tertiary care. And also we should integrate horizontally with the other specialities, uh, medicine, surgery, pediatrics, and even uh, legal medicine at times. Other thing is uh, family physicians should have an understanding of the context of the illness. For example, uh, a patient coming to the hospital, uh, the whole context uh, is actually removed. We don't see what is happening at home, isn't it? So uh, to understand the thing rightly, we need to see it both out as well as in the environment. Uh, and to have acquaintance with the whole range of its variations according to an American philosopher. So uh, I'll illustrate this using an example. So I uh, had the opportunity to do a home visit in Ariale. Ariale is actually supposed to be one of those areas where the uh, you know the war uh, was so highly prevalent and the rebels used to hide there. I was told, and it's a very rural village. So uh, the clinic book mentioned uh, of this uh, patient, a 75-year-old female with a history of right-sided ischemic stroke, managed at the university, uh, sorry, uh, the teaching hospital of Jaffna in uh, December, and she had diabetes, she had impaired mobility, and she hadn't followed up after being treated, and she was living uh, with the spouse. So you can see here the Jaffna Peninsula. So this is how we went. Uh, so we went on this home visit, and you can see these palmyra trees. And, um, you know, it's a very dry uh, area. And uh, transportation was provided like this. And uh, so this uh, you can see the how we entered the house. The, uh, the you know, the fence was uh, by the palmyra leaves. 
and uh, so the began the consultation so this was her house so that uh, what was mentioned in that clinic book doesn't say anything about what's going on so you can see uh, uh, the house as well as you can see a small dog also there and uh, uh, beside the family physician is the community health worker which i'll be talking a bit about later and then we came up with a management plan so this management plan also involved uh, that she needs a walking aid so how to uh, but you know we had this problem you know how how would she get a walking aid so the so we did a mobility assessment so her mobility was uh, poor and uh, you can see uh, there was uh, this chair and she was trying to walk using that and the uh, community health workers uh, the trained community health workers uh, uh, taught us uh, did some physiotherapy so we came up with this solution where we uh, the gave a chair we gave a chair soon after the consultation we went to the furniture shop uh, got this strong plastic chair and then uh, so we gave it to her so so this is what we did which i've never which i honestly as in my experience i'm only about uh, four to five years in uh, family medicine i have not something like this happening in this uh, at the other regions so this was very fascinating for me and this patient benefited moving on uh, use of all visits for preventive purposes so uh, this happens everywhere in any patient uh, we look at the patient in a comprehensive way and we make use of all visits for preventive care as well so you know in uh, the northern province uh, so there are activities uh, also based on this and uh, so the, uh, with the help of the community health workers there was uh, geriatric care nutrition programs and health promotion for probation school children because there are a lot of children uh, who were often because of the war and because of various other social issues and health promotion for drug addicts and counseling was also done and the other thing is uh, family physician should view the practice as a population at risk so for example uh, any patient above 45 we tend to think that this patient is at a risk of uh, non communicable disease so what uh, what is done uh, there is uh, there are regular ncd screening at the community centers so so you can see this is how it's done so there are community health workers doing checking the blood sugar as well as there's a dietitian educating about the diet they are all part of the family health center and use of community wide network of supports so let me elaborate what it is so as we discussed earlier family physicians cannot uh, function in isolation we need to uh, have a strong network and coordinate with may, many others so uh, the family health center coordinated or collaborated with many people including private hospitals and the ngos and uh, healthcare providers in the government sector and academic institutions both locally and internationally as well as the public and social workers actively collaborated with the family health center in uh, kondavil uh, which is a small uh, town in jaffna so uh, just to uh, highlight two things here uh, on to your uh, the presentation on to your left you can see uh, one of the landmark uh, things which happened the family medicine joining with uh, obsengaini and which led to the establishment of the women's health center you can see in the picture the consultant family physician as well as the vog working together which was wonderful to see which symbolizes harmony and uh, also to your right you can see uh, medical students and uh, and and uh, their teachers uh, who came to sri lanka from singapore so this is Sing from uh, a singaporean uh, university or medical students they came to japna to experience uh, to learn about rural health care so uh, just to see uh, how uh, collaboration is done and another thing is as gps ideally we should share with patients of the same habitat 
and when i went for my training in uh, the northern province of jaffna i i experienced it first hand where uh, if uh, so according to wendel berry he says if we do not live where we work and when we work we are wasting our lives and our work too and i i realized that if a family physician especially have to travel many kilometers on a daily basis we may not know what is really happening in the region so i realized that i lacked that when i was uh, training in jaffna and uh, but the people there the family physician there they knew what was going on i uh, and uh, you got to have an understanding of their health problems the geography the culture language climate and even the history in this case the recent uh, ethnic conflict so uh, just to see some of the things uh, in their culture so care of patients in office home and hospital just uh, as family physician we should not confine ourselves to the walls so as uh, uh, based on our theme beyond the clinic walls so we should go beyond the clinic walls so in here i want to illustrate uh, the many uh, places where the family physician was at uh, work the office and also during a home visit and also the family physician was uh, involved with telemedicine telemedicine consultation and sometimes the family physician was asked to uh, inspect the school and also probation center and i uh, for the first time in my life i got the opportunity to go to prison just to uh, take care of the patients and uh, recognition of the subjective aspects of medicine that is also important thing uh, as a family physician so subjective aspects uh, one thing is uh, as family physicians we should be um, sort of uh, sensitive to the emotions uh, of the people uh, in my case it was a challenge because i had the issue the language and the culture barrier but with uh, you know body language and you know non verbal cues i was able to sort of manage and uh, and this was emphasized for the medical students as well as for the community health workers so there were there are workshops there are regular programs on the importance of emotional intelligence for the medical students as well as for the community health workers who are part of the family medicine team so this is one such program we actually the medical students are doing a drama uh, about uh, a scenario regarding uh, emotional intelligence uh, teaching next is uh, one of the most important things uh, for a rural family physician that is an awareness of, of the need to manage the resources as family physicians we are always uh, limited by the resources we have so this is a lot more uh, prevalent when you are working in a difficult region so um, some of the challenges were inadequate staff and also the complexity of the problems and also uh, in addition there were other burdens which a family physician had to do so there are we have here family uh, physicians who are lecturers uh, who are teachers tutors of family medicine so and also um, for problems in patient transport compared to urban area transport is a bigger problem and also uh, one thing is about research which a family physician would find it very difficult to do with the busy schedules so uh, at kondaville i saw the you know they took it as these unique selling points these challenges and they came up with their own unique solutions so i will uh, discuss i will just uh, uh, show you one or two of those so one thing is uh, uh, about uh, you know community members being trained to practice health care so these community members were mainly women they were carefully selected through a process and they were the key people uh, or the center of the system and uh, these women were selected and they undergo capacity building education and also employment on the job training for example to check blood sugar check blood pressure and how about uh, giving food care and so on 
and uh, so and they became empowered women in the community uh, doing uh, community health work so i was also involved in some of these things uh, i observed how home uh, and home gardening activity for community health workers i was also under the sun uh, you know working with them uh, because it's important that uh, if you are let's say you are if you are wearing the tie and the coat and you just uh, go with them they will not really have a build up a rapport with you you have to just be with them and also uh, i was uh, involved in an activity on work life balance for these community health workers so it's a, a part of a structured program so these are the effects uh, these uh, women get empowered as well as their families and uh, these empowered women uh, then work as community health workers and these empowered women and their families get involved and engage with the stakeholders so who are the stakeholders health ministry hospital consultants and various other departments ngos academics public forum and uh, which leads to overall strengthening of the primary care and then as well as uh, we are we one can uh, we are able to do research because uh, this medical the data is maintained and uh, with uh, the university or the family health center uh, the even the university of birmingham and university of manchester and so on are collaborating and because of that they are getting lot of funds so final outcome is basically uh, a five star doctor one can be, be a five star doctor uh, that means uh, not only being a, a care provider a family physician uh, should be a ideally be a decision maker communicator community leader also a manager and this is uh, the ideal profile of a physician proposed by charles bolan 1993 and recently uh, the five star doctor award was also given to dr sanat thetty i believe and uh, i really admire uh, my heart uh, mother teresa saint teresa of calcutta and uh, she emphasized uh, serve the poorest of the poor always so i also believe that uh, whatever we do it should benefit the poor or rather the poorest of the poor not only the rich but that doesn't mean urban uh, healthcare is not important urban healthcare is very much important but also rural healthcare and uh, these are my references and based on my experience uh, i was uh, motivated to write an article uh, about uh, jaffna and uh, which was uh, published recently in the island paper my gratitude to uh, dr s kumaran and my mentor dr tivankar and also my colleagues in family medicine staff colleges and uh, sri lanka medical association and uh, medical students of jaffna as all as well as my parents my father helped me to sort of practice the timing today before doing the presentation so thank you any questions i'm happy to answer we can go for lunch i would like to ask you a question so you mentioned about home visits which is very unique to family physician how do we sustain it in rural uh, area where the economic Situation might be drier than in the urban setup. Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, actually, what I observed there was um, the home visits. They were funded by non-governmental organizations, and there were a lot of donors. Nothing, no funding, absolutely whatsoever from the government for these activities because simply, uh, I mean, it was not part of the program, and uh, the donors were very happy, and they were. sort of uh, very encouraging to do these things and they funded the transportation and uh, also uh, the salaries are paid for the community health workers so uh, this home visits happen regularly you said you all went and bought a chair yes how did it, that's innovative i know but uh, what what how did it happen and what was the outcome of that chair 
Yeah, actually, um, how did that happen was, sir, so now we identified that as an issue with the yeah. mobility and uh, the chair which she had was not strong enough and uh, and she was not able to uh, purchase a walker. And then uh, we thought, uh, you know, a chair, a strong chair would be very helpful. And uh, and to purchase that, we so there was uh, there were funding. So um, so we took that bill, and actually the, the that was not given free of charge. This chair was given to her, and where she had to she has to pay uh, you know easy easy payment scheme. And um, uh, I know this might not be the ideal the best solution for mobility, but it serves two purposes. Because you saw in that house there was not a proper chair to sit in, so she can use it for that as well as for mobility. Mobility means you say the walker you. Yeah, it yeah, okay. push it forward like that. Good, that's in. So in a rural uh, medicine, I believe one has to be very innovative, innovative with very what good, we have. Very I'm very happy working in rural medicine. It's very good. And uh, just a note to Professor Sivanjana Sundaram was one of the pioneers who. Uh, did a lot combined family medicine and community medicine. I remember long years ago we went and delivered lectures in the Jaffna faculty on with him. He's a brilliant man he was. Thank you. Nice that you paid a tribute to him. I'm working at uh, Division Hospital Kadugan now as a as an acting consultant in family medicine. Um, there are, in the government sector, there are public health nursing officers. There should be one at least for uh, one uh, covering the draining area of division hospital, uh, so that uh, public health nursing officer mainly uh, she uh, I mean arrange the things. Uh, only issue is we don't have enough time to do that. Usually we do it as a demonstration for medical students, so somebody is going to come come in for learning. Otherwise, actually we are trying to innovate uh, new things how to sustain it. That is very important, actually. And uh, I also have been to the places uh, Dr. Halpi mentioned with Dr. Kumaran. Uh, actually, it's uh, very, very much uh, refreshing and very much, uh, I mean, you feel that you are doing something for the community. Right. Thank you. Thank you. I believe that can be done uh, in other parts of the country as well. It should, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Are there any other questions online? Uh, so in the absence of uh, any further questions, I would like to give some closing remarks. So our discussion today have shed light on the immense and daily roles of IT physicians that we play, from delivering personalized care to advocating for public health. The case discussions also provided us with concrete examples of the challenges and the triumphs faced by family physicians in their daily practice. Moreover, our focus on the role of family physicians in the rural healthcare system has highlighted the critical importance of their work in the underserved areas, ensuring that quality care should be accessible to all, as she said, the poorest of the poor. So as we come to uh, the close of to today's session, beyond the clinical wall, a family physician's journey in healthcare, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to our distinguished speakers today and for all those who participated and uh, contributed actively. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you, Dinesh Ali, for moderating this uh, very interesting uh, session on family medicine. The topics were so good, and the speakers presented it excellently. So, thank you to all of you. Just as a token of appreciation from the Sri Lanka Medical Association for your participation. May I call upon, I would really like to give this token. So, may I invite Dr. Mary Lou Darmakan first. Thank you. 